up to this point, we've been looking at the client and we've been looking at the server, but we haven't put much consideration into who else is talking to the server in our system, all the peers, all right? So these are all just client applications, just like this one. But the distinction is because we are focusing on this client and to this client, every other client is a peer, right? So they are just other clients, so they're running the same code. They're trying to do the same things that our client has been in all the previous videos. So what are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to send input change requests, trying to get the server to update the state of their player entities. And those changes are occurring in the server while we make our changes, right? So what we're trying to do today is just like we were replicating the server's local state when we received a message from the server saying, your entity is at whatever position. We want to do the same, but for the peer entities. So we're no longer just looking at what is the server telling us about our client's entity. We want to look at what is the server telling us about the peer client's entities. So what do we got here? Well, we have this peer sending this input change request. We have the server doing its simulation processing just like normal. And the only difference here is when the server is done processing and it determines that it needs to update the state of all its clients, it will send a response back to the one client that requested the update just like we have been doing in the previous examples, but it's also going to send a message to every other client, in this case, us, right? So the peer, uh, the user on a particular peer presses a key, triggers an input update. We make the request out to the server, server updates its state, and then our client, the one that we're focusing on, gets that updated state at some point. And as a reminder, what state is contained in that message? Well, it's going to say what position the peer is at, and we're going to use the other values that we've been using in our past examples. So input state is just going to be moving to the right, and the velocities are just going to be one unit per tick, uh, in this case, in the positive x direction. So we have these peers sending messages, causing simulation state updates, and causing messages to be received by us. And we're going to want to replicate them in some way, but first let's look at how time works in this system. So we have tick 24 here and we have tick 20 on the server. Just like we set up in the last video, we have the synchronization going. So we have the client ahead in time in relation to the server. We also have the same thing for the peers because all the peers are of course, just clients doing same exact thing. So the relationship here is each client is in the same or somewhat the same time reference with each other. That is something that you can get tripped up on because it doesn't actually matter, right? This client never directly talks to this peer. So when we're thinking about peer replication, what we're actually doing is we're thinking about the client trying to replicate a state update that the server made. We don't actually care about this message that the peer sent when we're looking from the point of view of this client. So time-wise, we have this client on tick 24, server on tick 20, right? Let's look at how the times line up when we get the peer message. So message gets sent on tick 24, arrives at tick 24. Server does processing, sends it. And now the server is sending a message for tick 24 and we're receiving it on tick 32. Now that might be kind of weird because we can see here only four ticks pass. There's four ticks of latency between the server sending this message and us receiving it. 
So why is there a difference of eight ticks? Well, we have to remember, uh, we have set up this relationship where our client is ahead of the server by an amount equal to the latency in the system. So when four ticks pass, we have four ticks of latency. And then we also have our client in the future by that same amount. So we have two times the latency. And that is the difference between when the server sent the message and when we received it. So we have eight ticks of difference for four ticks of latency. So that's a little uh, weird thing that we need to internalize. When we're going from client to server, the message will be received on the same tick because we've set up our time references such that we have that convenience. But when we're going from server to client, it's going to be working in the opposite direction. It's kind of like we're fighting upstream. Uh, by the time we receive the message, it's going to look like it's further in the past. So another way to think about it is at a given point in time, like let's look at this tick 32 line, the server is actually at the current time. The client is in the future and any messages we received about our peer state is from the past, right? So the current time would be 28. The future where the client is is 32. And the peer state that we're able to replicate is from tick 24 in the past. All right, so hopefully we have time somewhat straight in our heads because now we have to make the decision with this peer state that we have, how do we want to replicate it? We could, as soon as we get a message, like say we get this and it's four tick 24, we could say, hey, we received data about a peer. Let's just apply it to the simulation as fast as possible. We could do that. So when we get this message, we would immediately pop up the peer entity uh, according to this data. The issue with that is the network is inconsistent, right? The network sometimes might give us one message on a particular tick. Sometimes it might give us none. Sometimes it might give us two or three. So if we're always processing all of the messages that we've received since the last tick, then we're going to get inconsistent processing. And as a result, our peers' movement, even though they might be moving smoothly on their screen and the server might be processing it such that they're fairly smooth, by the time we receive it and replicate it, they would be uh, moving jerkily. They wouldn't be moving smoothly. So we want to have some approach that accounts for that. We want to be able to take a bunch of updates and account for the inconsistencies in the network to smooth things out. So we can do that using this concept of a desired tick. And what this is, is when we are on a particular tick, so in this description I say sim tick x, client simulation tick x, so let's say 32. When we're on tick 32, we can expect to receive peer data for tick x minus some offset. So on tick 32, the client can expect to receive peer data from tick 32 minus some number, right? X minus the offset would be the desired tick that we want to replicate peers at. So just looking at it visually in this example, we'll get to it programmatically in a second, but just looking at our system and when things are sent and when they arrive, we can see on tick 32, our desired tick in a perfect situation would be 24 because we are receiving a message for tick 24 on tick 32. So if our desired tick was 24, we'd be able to process it immediately. Now on tick 33, we would have 25 and so on. We would be aiming to process one message per tick. And the offset that we apply would account for the network latency and the network inconsistency such that 
when we, uh, or as we continue to move through time, we should always have at least one message to apply. So that's our approach for smoothing things out a bit. But the question is, how do we get this offset? What would an offset be that accounts for this latency in some way, and also that adjusts itself when the latency changes? So if someone in your house starts up Netflix or something like that, the latency between your client and the server might change by a drastic amount, and it might stay changed for a while. We want to be able to account for that. Well, we already have a system set up that kind of does that, right? We have the adjustment system that we set up in the previous video. So we have this adjustment system that's maintaining a count of how many ticks of latency we have. And it's based on the server receiving messages and checking how far in the future or in the past that message is in relation to its current tick. So if, if we have this adjustment system going on, then we can keep track of the total adjustment to have a number that says how many ticks worth of latency we actually have. So that's what the total adjustment here is. Our offset wants to account for latency to say how far in the past our desired tick should be, the tick that we would like to process to replicate peers at. And that offset can be found by using the total adjustment times negative two. Now, I'll explain the total adjustment in a second. Uh, I'll give a more concrete example, but why negative two? Well, the negative's easy because we want to put the peer in the past. If we had a positive value here, then, uh, or actually, the math works out such that this would actually end up being a positive value. So here you wouldn't actually need the negative. But uh, the way I actually apply it, let me fix this, yeah. Here we go, plus the offset. And then you have a negative offset. And that makes more sense because when we're looking at an offset conceptually, we wanna see, does it move us into the future or the past? So we want a negative offset because for people maintaining that code or even people trying to understand what's going on, having a negative offset is more indicative that we are moving into the past with it. So we want an offset that pushes us into the past. So we use negative here. And we want to account for that phenomena that I pointed out earlier, where going from client to server, we have the same tick, but going from server to client, we have double the latency, or we perceive things as double the latency from the client's point of view. Of course, there isn't actually double latency. Latency is still four ticks. It's just the client sees it as being from eight ticks in the past. So uh, how do we actually get the total adjustment? So we know the negative and the two. How do we get the total adjustment? That's pretty simple. All we need to do is in our adjustment system, whenever we add a number or make an adjustment, we just need to track the sum of all of them. So like in the example from the last video, we started with a plus five and I think we added a plus two. I don't quite remember, but let's say we start at plus five during the connection and the server told us to adjust by plus two at some point. Well, we'd have a total adjustment of plus seven. So in that case, our offset would be seven times negative two, so it'd be negative 14. So if we had an adjustment of plus seven, if we had seven ticks of latency in the system, uh, of average latency, to be clear, in the system, we'd say on client sim tick, 32, for example, we could expect to receive peer data for tick 32 minus 14, right? So that's how far into the past we can be on average expecting to receive peer data from. So that's all we need there. We 
have a concept of how far back in time we should be replicating these pairs. And the actual replication part is simple. It's just taking the message for the particular tick and applying it uh, to your client's local simulation. But there's one more question left. And that question is, when we run out of data, what do we do? Right? So if we no longer have messages to apply, how do we handle a update? Like if we have a desired tick, but we don't have any messages for that tick. Well, there's two approaches to that. One is we could extrapolate into the future. Basically, whatever direction entities were moving in, we could keep moving them in that direction. And that works if you only have to go one tick into the future, because we have authoritative data that tells us where an entity is and what direction it's moving. So you can make a safe extrapolation one tick into the future. But if you have to go multiple ticks into the future, then you open up the possibility that the peer actually changed position. So maybe they were moving to the right and you didn't receive their data for a few ticks, so you kept moving them to the right, but they stopped moving at some point. So when you eventually receive an update that says they moved differently, you would have to teleport them to where they actually are. So you're sacrificing a little bit of smoothness in order to have this aggressive approach where you keep things moving as much as possible. The other option is to wait for known state. And this is the conservative approach, so typically you would add a little bit of extra latency here because you're not uh, building some sort of application that needs very low latency messaging. So in this approach, you'd add a little bit of extra latency to make sure that you have messages to process, and you would go with the idea of not moving entities unless you have authoritative state for them. So in this case, if you ran out of data, you just wouldn't move the entities, but you would try to reduce the amount of times you've run out of data by adding a little bit of extra latency. Uh, and by adding extra latency, I mean you'd just be buffering more data. You would be pushing your desired tick a little bit farther back into the past. So with that, uh, we know how to do peer replication pretty much. It's not too crazy of a concept. It gets a little bit of a little bit fiddly as you're actually implementing it, but definitely not as bad as synchronization from the last video. So peer replication is the last concept that we're going to go over for kind of the core networking for virtual worlds uh, set of videos. Past this, uh, I'm going to go into advanced topics for large player count situations. So the types of features and systems you need to add if you want 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 players on a single server setup. Besides that, I'm going to eventually add supplemental videos where for each of these uh, theory videos, we would do some code walkthrough of actual implementations, and maybe we'd look into how it's done in different engines a little bit. But those are going to take a little bit more time. Those aren't super high priority for me. But if you would like one of those videos, if there's one of these topics that you would like a code walkthrough on, go ahead and comment, and I can prioritize that video a little more. But for now, that is it. Thank you for sticking along up to this point. Uh, if you're going to stay on for more videos, I'll see you there. Otherwise, good luck with your project.